Hi, grade, grade 11. So now we can finally get to our lesson on intermolecular forces and bonding. The first job that you will have is to distinguish whether the question is asking about bonding or the question is asking about intermolecular forces. So when you see the word bonding, you need to know that it is always going to be between two atoms. So we've got one atom here that is bonding with another atom to form one new particle that is called a molecule. So remember, everything is called particles. That's a particle, that's a particle. We've got, and that's a particle. The two simple particles are then joining to form a bigger particle. Okay, so when we see the word forces, then you need to realize it is intermolecular forces. So once the one molecule has already been formed, so you can see here's a molecule that's already been formed, and there's a molecule that's already been formed. Now when we say forces, we are looking at the almost the Velcro that keeps them together there, and that's the intermolecular force. And if that force is very, very strong, then we have a solid. If that force is weaker, we have a liquid. And if that force is very, very weak, then we'll have a gas. So the first thing we're going to look at is just revising. I know most of you have done it already, but just quickly looking at what is bonding again. So when you see bonding, there's only three types. So for bonding, we've either got ionic bonding, covalent bonding, or metallic bonding. So you'll see when we go and look at exam questions, that's the first thing you need to decide for yourself. Is it ionic, covalent, or metallic? And how do we differentiate between those two? Three, actually, very simple. So ionic, for our purposes until matric, we're always going to say it's going to be a, between a non-metal atom and a metal atom. Now you have learned electronic structure in grade 10, and you will see that the metal will always give its electron to the non-metal. So you learned last year that it's a transfer of electrons. So what then happens is that the non-metal ion will always become a negative ion, and the metal ion will always become a positive ion. And as you've just learned in electrostatics, if you have a positive and a negative, then there will be an electrostatic force between these two particles. And that electrostatic force is what keeps them um, together then. So what you basically have is a structure of a positive ion and a negative ion and a positive ion. And we call this an ionic lattice. So questions that they love asking about ionic bonding is why does an ionic substance not conduct electricity in the solid phase? And then you must say, or you can see clearly, that the electrostatic forces are keeping them together here, so they cannot move. And for electricity, you need charges to be free to move so that you can have electricity flowing, because electricity is a flow of charge. So to take this ionic bond and this ionic substance and make it able to conduct electricity, there's two things you can do. And they like asking that as well. So you can either make them an AQ substance, which means you dissolve them in water, or you can melt them, which makes you, which means you make them a liquid. So if they're in water, that means you've got your little positive and negative ions still floating around here, but they're surrounded now by water particles. So the water particles go in between the ions, and therefore the ions are now free to move and conduct electricity. For the liquid, you know already from grade 8 that when you heat up substances, you're giving the particles energy, so now the positive and the negative ions are not um, attracted so strongly by each other. The heat makes them gain energy, so they can overcome this electrostatic force, and they can then start rolling over each other, which means they can move, and again they can conduct electricity. So... That's for ionic bonding. So I'm just going to get rid of this a little bit. And then we can move on to covalent bonding. So, when we look at covalent bonding, actually I want to leave covalent bonding for last. Let's just quickly look at metallic bonding, because covalent bonding is where we're going to spend most of our time in this chapter. So if you 
think back of metallic bonding in grade 10, you learned that metallic bonding is between metals. It's as simple as that. You have to have metal atoms combining with metal atoms. And most of the time, it's just the one metal that you're talking about. So for metallic bonding, what you have is a metal nucleus of the one atom next to another metal nucleus of the other atom, and so on and so on. It's also called the metallic lattice sometimes. So you can see it's a nice little pattern of pluses next to each other. But then you do know that an atom doesn't only have a nucleus, but in a metal, these orbitals that surround the nuclei are very close together because the metal is so dense. So what happens is the electrons in the outside energy level, that you'll remember we call valence electrons, those electrons in the outside energy level are not really sure if they belong to that positive or that positive. So what they can do is they can move. So you call them you call them delocalized electrons, and these delocalized electrons were then free to move to carry electricity as well. So metals are conductors because electrons can move. Ionic substances can be conductors when their ions are able to move. Make sure you know the difference between those particles there. So the the particles here are still are not called molecules yet. Please remember that. Ionic substances do not form molecules. They form ions. Metallic um, bonding does not form a molecule. It forms positive kernels, is what you call them, in grade 10. And um, they're surrounded by the sea of delocalized electrons. Now we can look at covalent bonding. And for covalent bonding, you were saying that it's a sharing of electrons. So for co covalent, we're always going to share, an e share electrons. And it's always going to be a non-metal atom combining with another non-metal atom. Okay, so let's look at, a, at a, an example of that. So what you've done in grade 10 already, you looked at something like O2. So you've got an O and another O. And in this chapter, you're just going to have to make sure that you know um, Lewis structures. So you have to keep your periodic table close by. So oxygen is in group 7, so it's got, oh, such a lie, in group 6. So it's got 6 um, valence electrons. So you can draw 1, 2, 3, go now, 4, 5, 6 electrons for the oxygen. And then you can do the same for the other oxygen. Let's just make it easier and do another color. I don't know why this one is making it difficult for me to write now. But you can see there's the electrons again. So they are sharing and there and there. So those electrons are being shared and these electrons are being shared. Okay, so now what you have to look at when you look at covalent bonding is are those electrons being shared evenly between the two atoms or will the one atom maybe steal those bonding pairs of electrons more to its side? And to do that, you have to look at the electronegativity difference between these two um, atoms. So it's abbreviated sometimes as electronegativity difference, but you can also write that out. So if you look at the uh, these two, you will see on your periodic table that oxygen, the electronegativity, I think, is 2.5. And if you look at the other oxygen atom, it's obviously exactly the same. So they have the exact same um, pool for this electron. So if you look at the definition, it's basically telling you how badly will one of these atoms want these electrons in the middle. So these electrons in the middle are exactly evenly shared between the two oxygens. And when you see something like that, and there's no difference in electronegativity, so that means the answer to this question is no, then you know that you've got a non-polar covalent bond. So that's how you decide if it's a non-polar um, polar covalent bond. So then we have to also look at when it is a polar covalent bond. So that me that's going to mean that the answer to that question is now yes. So what you're going to say to yourself again 
is, is there a difference in electronegativity? So let's look at something that's a little bit different. Let's look at H and F. If you look at hydrogen, they it only has one electron. If you look at fluorine, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. So you can see that these electrons are being shared. So to decide if it's a polar or non-polar molecule, you have to look at the electronegativity difference again. So if you look at hydrogen, the electronegativity difference is 2.1. And if you look at fluorine, ugh, I mean the electronegativity is 2.1. And if you look at fluorine, the electronegativity is 4. So there's a big difference between these two. And it means that fluorine is going to have a stronger pull um, it could attract these bonding pairs, the bonding pair of electrons much stronger, which means we get a dipole moment in this direction. So the electrons is going to spend most of their time on the fluorine side, and therefore we're going to call this bond between the hydrogen and the fluorine a polar covalent bond because the answer to this question was yes, there is a difference in electronegativity, and therefore it is a polar covalent bond. So if you have only two atoms, that's quite easy to decide. But if you get more um, atoms, it, or you have to look at only two atoms. So now we're going to look at the shape of the molecule. So firstly, you're going to look at the just two atoms at a time and decide on the bonding. And then we're going to look at the shape of the molecule to decide if the whole molecule is polar or non-polar. So let's do that. Before we go there, there's just one very, very important thing that we have to do. So once you've decided whether it's ionic, covalent, or metallic, there's only one of these that can take us forward from here, and that is super, super important. You need to know what are the particles that are involved. So if you have an ionic bond, the particles involved are still ions. Please, please remember that. They have not, they are still ions. They are just positive and negative ions attracting each other. If you look at a metallic bond, yeah, the particles that you form in a metallic bond are still the positive nuclei, and you also called them positive kernels last year. Um, so positive nuclei or kernels. And then it's got a sea of delocalized electrons. So it's actually still atoms that you have here. So the atoms are still there. And then the last one here, which is the one that we're going to spend most of our time on in this chapter, is when I have the sharing of electron. This one is the one that are forming molecules and it's the only one that form will form a molecule. So only when you know it's a covalent bond can you say that there's now going to be intermolecular forces or can you talk about the shape of the molecule? Otherwise, you can't talk about the shape of the molecule at all. So we're quickly going to look at the different shapes of the molecules, but I think I need to stop this video because it's getting a little bit long. So that was the um, quickly revision of ionic covalent and metallic bonding, and then we're going to look at the shapes of the molecule in the next video.